Arpaio and inter, um, uh, intercepted his communications with his attorneys during the trial. A big no-no. And they communicated the Justice Department directly with the judge, ex parte, in violation of the law. Despite all of these irregularities... Sheriff Joe could not get a return phone call from uh, Steve Bannon. He could not get even the sympathetic ear of the Trump White House. Now, fortunately, comes word that um, this has come to the president's attention, finally, and that he has ordered the White House counsel to prepare a pardon for Sheriff Joe Arpaio. Uh, this is extraordinarily good news. The president is headed for Phoenix, and I can think of no better location than, uh, than Phoenix, Arizona, to announce this act of justice and mercy. So um, uh, kudos to the president. Uh, however, the criticism of his staff remains the same. It's a shame that the president had to wait so long to learn about this miscarriage of justice. We also learned today that Congressman Dana Rohrabacher, Republican of California, has met with Julian Assange, the publisher of WikiLeaks. For some time, I have reported here at InfoWars that a secret grand jury had been convened uh, originally during the Obama administration, but um, was not uh, uh, terminated under the Trump Justice Department, and an effort is being made by the Trump Justice Department to seek a criminal indictment against Assange in the United States. For what, we don't know. It's not clear what, if any, law Mr. Assange has broken. Julian Assange is not a Russian asset. The government mindlessly, through the intelligence agencies, repeats that mantra over and over again without a scintilla of evidence that it is true. Uh, at the same time, uh, Mr. Assange is a journalist who is neither of the left nor the right, but who is outraged by the tremendous abuses of power and corruption that he has learned about. Now, for those who say, well, Assange's sin is that he prints stolen material, material he has received from whistleblowers, Perhaps you should look at the Pentagon Papers case, New York Times uh, versus USA, during the Nixon administration. Or perhaps you should look at the writings of Bob Woodward, who regularly publishes classified information that he's gotten from third-party sources. This is within the greatest traditions of American journalism. It is hardly illegal, uh, and it is not illegal in the case of Julian Assange. Who will now tell the president that his Justice Department is seeking an indictment against WikiLeaks? Mr. Bannon is gone, but I can think of many individuals with solid Trump credentials, real libertarians, real liberty-oriented uh, Republicans who worked in this campaign, men like David Urban or Ed Martin, um, who could easily fill these shoes. The idea that conservatives will be at a disadvantage because the Trump White House is now largely peopled with New York liberal Democrats like Gary Cohn or the president's son-in-law, well, that may be true, but it's only true because Steve Bannon would never go to bat for Trump campaign veterans seeking positions in the Trump administration, either in the White House or in the departments. As I said earlier, it's like an individual throwing themselves on the mercy of the court, uh, a man who kills his parents and then argues that, the, that he should receive mercy because he's an orphan. We, uh, we are, uh, therefore, I think, uh, at a point where the questions come at me, both by Twitter and uh, tweet and text and phone call, Fast and Furious, is the uh, elimination, uh, or I should say the termination of Bannon going to shift the Trump administration to the left? Who will guard the basic tenets of Trumpism, the principles under which he got elected? 
Well, the Trump revolution is much larger than Steve Bannon. It's much larger than any one individual uh, other than Donald Trump himself. One of Mr. Bannon's greatest sins was calling himself the chief White House strategist. While the chief strategist of Donald Trump's presidential campaign and of his White House is Donald Trump. With all fairness, by the time Bannon joined the campaign for the final weeks, uh, the basic tenets of the Trump platform had long been decided. It was Donald Trump himself who hit upon immigration and the wall, who hit upon the idea of revamping and overhauling our veterans health care system, which is sadly broken, uh, who talked about the inequity of our NATO partners not paying their fair share, who talked about how the enormous international globalist trade deals were sucking the jobs out of middle America. Donald Trump is the man who came up with these themes, not Stephen K. Bannon. And with the help of Sam Nunberg, who was terminated early in the campaign, he honed each one of these messages to perfection. And he never deviated from them uh, from the early campaign until election day. No, the chief strategist of the Trump campaign is Donald Trump. Uh, we are, uh, therefore, uh, I'm confident that there will not be a change in course. The idea that the Trump uh, White House will move to the left is unfounded. And, in fact, uh, the entire dynamic surrounding the Charlottesville incident, which smells more and more like a false flag with every uh, passing day, as more and more investigative journalists like Lee Stranahan start to dig into the facts about what really transpired, uh, we learn that this was a provocation because the Russian collusion delusion has failed. They could get no traction on the phony Russian issue. So now we have slipped back to race baiting as uh, as a political tactic. One thing I agree with Steve Bannon on in an interview I saw yesterday. If the Democrats want to talk about race and we talk about economic prosperity, we will win. If Donald Trump will stick to his guns that violence on the left or the right must be denounced, is wrong, is not the answer. But focus most principally on the need for economic prosperity, well, then uh, the president will fight for his corporate tax cut, cutting our corporate taxes below those of Mexico, uh, Japan, China, Canada. Uh, that would sp spook what they, pardon me, that would spark what they will call the Trump boom, perhaps one of the greatest uh, peacetime expansions that we will ever experience. Now would be a very good time to remind you that we are under attack here uh, at InfoWars and a good time for you to go to the InfoWars.com store where we have an extraordinary special going on, which we named after our friends at BuzzFeed. Uh, amazing prices at 1776. So Brain Force Plus, 55% off. Survival Shield, 55% off at 1776. Silver Bullet, 66% off at $9.95. These are some of the best of the best products, and they're on special today. You see, we don't have a George Soros in the background writing us big checks, or a Ford Foundation, or a Rockefeller Foundation. We can only count on you. And when you buy at the Infowars.com store, you are not only getting the very best products tested rigorously with thousands of testimonials, but you're also helping the fight for freedom. You're helping plant the flag here at InfoWars and pay for the expansion that Alex Jones has planned. So please, folks, help in the fight for freedom. Go to the InfoWars.com store now and load up on some of these incredible products at at really bargain basement prices. Some of these are the best discounts we have ever had, and we need your support to continue the fight for freedom. I'm Roger Stone, filling in for Alex Jones today on The Alex Jones Show. Thanks for joining us. I'll be right back. Welcome back. 
I'm Roger Stone, sitting in for Alex Jones. It's well known that I have been a critic of the CNN analyst, Anna Navarro. First, a little truth in advertising. They should stop calling her a Republican strategist. She has never strategized a Republican campaign for any office in her life. She enjoys denigrating the president, calling him names constantly, bigot, racist, pig. She is endlessly abusive to her co-talent on CNN, John Phillips uh, and uh, Scotty Nell Hughes and others. Yet whenever she is criticized, she goes running to management, goes running to Jeff Zucker to complain. Now, finally, Anna Navarro, uh, the airhead diva, uh, a woman with no campaign experience or qualifications for her position as an analyst, has finally met her match. Today, she confronted Ed Martin, uh, formerly of Phyllis Schlafly's Eagle Forum, and a key uh, organizer in Donald Trump's Missouri campaign. Let's take a look at what happened. Everybody, every station, every pundit said, ah, he's getting more stability. I think we do need a president that's going to get better people all the time and improve people. But let me be very clear. Anna Navarro's wing of the Republican Party is over. The people that wanted amnesty, illegals on demand, free trade, that party, Romney, you know, Anna backed Huntsman, Romney, McCain, and Jeb. They lost everything. So we need to move on. I, look, I'm, Corker is a serious man. He's having expressing his concern. On the other hand, Corker and the Senate are still doing the, the work of Trump. Trump has put in more judges than Bush or uh, Obama did at the same point. He's moving ahead with regulatory reform. In America, where I live, not in whatever, where Anna and everyone talks to each other, we're seeing progress for America first. It really looks good to us. It feels better to us. Somebody's on our side. That's what's right. happening. Um, Anna, you should probably respond. <laughs> Honestly, I don't want to respond to this guy. Okay. I mean, I just, I mean, I, you know, frankly, okay, life is too short for me to spend it on she that. Voted, what I do want to talk about. She voted this, for listen, Hillary. She voted for listen, Hillary. And you voted for Hillary. Hillary. So, exactly, yeah. because I refuse to. Listen, you're not going to engage right. me. Honest to so goodness, you're, you're I find, like it, I find it a useless exercise and waste of my hey guys, time and my life this. doing this. So can I go back to the initial subject of matter that we were talking about before trying to get distracted? which is what Republicans are saying, and I commend those Republicans that are speaking out, because I think it's important for the country to see that there are Republicans standing up for... I mean, I just... Uh, and there you have it. Somebody finally uh, confronts Anna Navarro with her nonsense. Um, this is an extraordinarily abusive person. The people at CNN, the makeup people, the gaffers, the hairdressers and others talk me talk to me about her endless abuse she really thinks she's something special when she's nothing at all uh, later in the program we're going to be taking your calls uh, because there are many many questions about what will happen now with steve bannon out of the white house and what will happen in the wake of the charlottesville attack that number is one 800 Two five nine nine two three one again eight hundred two five nine nine two three one. I am anxious to take your calls here at Infowars. Also, while you've got a minute, go to the Infowars.com store where we have our seventeen seventy six BuzzFeed special. This is uh, dedicated to our friend Ben Smith at BuzzFeed. Since the BuzzFeed attack on the Infowars store last week, why our sales are up dramatically as thousands of Patriots have taken to the internet to give us the support we need. You will not find sales like this uh, anytime again soon. So folks, load up on some of the best products. We're talking about Caveman, uh, chocolate or strawberry at 30% off. We're talking about Silver Bullet, uh, but my all-time favorite, Brain Force, uh, which I'm using right now, took pop two of them before the show, helps keep you focused and alert. Uh, these are the very best of the best. And when you buy on the Infowars.com store now, you're helping the fight for freedom. You're helping us struggle against the globalists. We need your support. We value your support. The time is now. Please go to the Infowars.com store 
and stick it right up the nose of BuzzFeed. I'm Roger Stone, uh, happy to be sitting in for Alex Jones and anxious to take your calls. 800-259-9231. I'll be right back. Welcome back. I'm your host, Roger Stone, sitting in for Alex Jones. I spoke to Alex this morning after the vicious attack on him on the streets of Seattle, where he was scalded with hot coffee by some tolerant uh, liberal believer in free speech. Alex is fine, and he's anxious to get back in the fight, uh, but he urged me to take your calls, and that's what we're going to do here in just a moment. Uh, I do want to mention before we do that that the... Um, the uh, U.S. Cannabis Business Expo uh, is September 14th and 15th, and I have agreed to speak there. Yesterday, we uh, announced the formation, the formal formation of the U.S. Cannabis Coalition, a bipartisan, nonprofit, uh, uh, ad hoc committee designed to simply call on President Donald Trump to keep his courageous pledge to let the states decide when it comes to the question of medicinal marijuana. 29 states have now uh, legalized some form of medicinal marijuana. It is providing relief to millions, including veterans, providing millions in revenues for states and counties, uh, and creating thousands of jobs. Despite this, the White House Chief of Staff, John Kelly, and Attorney General Jeff Sessions have both threatened a crackdown uh, going back to the days pre-Obama when the federal government prosecuted marijuana use and distribution in the individual states. Yesterday, the website uscannabiscoalition.org was hacked and down for several hours. Today, we see an influx of Media Matters for America trolls trying to break up what is a bipartisan organization, which I am heading with the Orlando trial attorney and prominent Democrat John Morgan, a prospective candidate for governor of Florida. Morgan is personally responsible for financing the Democratic uh, past constitutional amendment in Florida that legalized medicinal marijuana in the Sunshine State. He's a hero of mine. And this bipartisan committee includes both Republicans and Democrats, liberals and conservatives, libertarians and progressives. Go to the site, check it out, come to the Business Expo, help us stop the trolls at MediaMatters.com. Uh, now let's go to your questions. I'm gonna start with Dave. From my home state of Connecticut, the nutmeg state, Dave, what's on your mind? Roger, thanks for having me. Um, we love you in Connecticut. We love Donald Trump. Um, we lost Michael Flynn. Today we lost uh, Steve Bannon. Um, I get it. He should have hired you to, to be in the White House with, with everyone else. Um, but we're left with uh, Gary Cohn, who's a registered uh, Democrat, and I just think we, uh, we we need to try and you know hang together and before we hang separately. And I just wanted to throw that in there and see what you thought. Well, I agree with you about General Flynn. Um, he should never have been dismissed. The president's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, gave the president a bad piece of advice on that subject. Uh, but at the same time, this has nothing to do with me. Uh, I have no interest in going into government. I'm a free spirit. I think I can be more effective on behalf of the president right here at Infowars.com and at Stone Cold Truth and out speaking around the country uh, and so on. But I do think that there are able men and women who were key players in the Trump revolution who were never recruited for this administration. In fact, they couldn't even get their calls returned. Uh, and on issue after issue, unfortunately, Steve Bannon, who's a good man, did not step up to the plate. Uh, for those who complain that the White House is now full of liberal New York Democrats, those are the same people who didn't help any other Trump supporters get into the Trump administration. I agree with you on Gary Cohn. I think he has to go. Uh, and I do think that, um, for example, that General H.R. McMaster, who we have now tied directly to George Soros, not only in terms of his communications with Soros as based on 
reports from an Israeli intelligence, but also linking him to a think tank uh, prior to his service in the Trump White House uh, that was funded by Soros and the Ford Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, these people also must go. Uh, and uh, I'm not uh, by any means in that camp, but uh, on issue after issue, whether it is uh, the plight of Sheriff Joe Arpaio or the prosecution of Julian Assange or whether it is the State Department where Rex Tillerson uh, has turned out to be a puppet of Condoleezza Rice. And the Trump foreign policy looks to me like the Bush Romney neocon foreign policy. Dave, you're right. There's a vacuum in the White House and we need a Trump person to fill it not Roger Stone. There are many fine young and uh, fine men and women who are capable of filling Mr. Bannon's shoes. Let's go to uh, Stephen in the state of Florida, my new home state. Stephen, what's on your mind? Yeah, hey, Roger. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Okay. Yeah, but what I wanted to talk about is this. As a student of U.S. history, you know that our Supreme Court has come down with decisions stating to this effect that an attack on America is an attack on Jesus Christ because it was founded as a Christian nation. That's almost a direct quote from one of their decisions they came down with. That's when our Supreme Court was good. Uh, hopefully we're going back in that direction. But the reason I say that is because uh, there's a man that's gone on Alex Jones' show now a couple of times, three, three or four times, including yesterday, and that is Rodney Howard Brown. And that's the thing. He's being called Rodney Brown because he doesn't want people in the know about him to recognize who he really is and what he's trying to do, which I, this is what I believe, okay? And I would encourage Dallas and his reporters to look into this man's background. This guy spearheaded the notorious... Uh, a holy laughter movement that made a total mockery of Jesus Christ and the gospel ministry. And the thing is, when he says he will not disclose the supposed congressman he met with that told him that they're going to take out Trump, that has proved to me that he is lying about that situation. I don't dispute the information he gave about his knowledge of the New World Order and history and such, but I think he's just using Alex and this whole situation with Trump, what's now going on, as a name dropper, someone that's just trying to further his own selfish agenda because if indeed the president is being threatened like that, it's the same as if a pastor finds out about someone that's a child molester. He at that point has an obligation to turn that person in to the authorities. The fact that Rodney Howard Brown will not do that to me is no surprise All right. knowing his background. All right, Stephen, um, I think we've got the gist. Let me make a couple comments. I don't know uh, Pastor Brown. But uh, my friend Gary Heaven brought my attention to a very disturbing article uh, that appeared at Zero Hedge in which both the former CIA director John Brennan, who is a convert to radical Islam, who is actually a convert to Wahhabism at the time that he was the uh, CIA station chief in Rida, uh, actually threatens the life of the president of the United States only to be joined by James Clapper, who was the head of defense intelligence under Obama. These uh, would essentially, um, these gentlemen saying that uh, if uh, Mueller is fired, that, um, that Trump will be taken out. Uh, and they don't mean that uh, in a democratic sense. There's some <clears throat> footage you see of the actual program with Wolf Blitzer. This would lead me to believe that the fundamental story of Pastor Brown is correct that there is a plot to remove the president um, that I imagine would only be triggered if they believe that they cannot co-opt him as General Kelly is trying to do right now, or they can't impeach him based on a trumped up charge brought by Mr. Mueller, call it perjury or some other false charge. I pray every night for the president's personal safety and the safety of his family. There are a lot of lunatics out there. 
Donald Trump is a brave and courageous man even to pursue this job, never mind to fill it. Uh, but Stephen, thank you for your call. Uh, let's take another while we have time. Uh, how about Michael in Texas? Michael, let her rip. Yes, uh, Mr. Stone. Nice to speak to you. Enjoy your commentary on Alex Jones' Info Wars. Thank you, Michael. What's your question? To one of the, yes, I take exception to one of the comments you made about Mr. Bannon, however. Go. You said, I guess, well, you commented that you didn't think the, that it would go more left with the absence of Mr. Bannon. But I, but I caution you to realize that it was people like Nancy Pelosi asking for his ouster. So now he's gone. So essentially, Mr. Trump has complied with the request of Nancy Pelosi. So how much more left do you want to get? Well, he was also complying with my request yesterday in the Daily Caller and a number of other conservatives who've determined uh, that Steve is a spent force. Nobody is indispensable in this revolution, not Roger Stone, not Alex Jones, nobody but the president. He is indispensable, uh, and I believe he will be replaced. I, I will be on the forefront of those criticizing uh, General McMaster, criticizing uh, General Kelly, as I just did, um, it, I would uh, see your argument if Bannon had been more effective. But his greatest single goal seemed to be the great the self-aggrandizement of Bannon himself. This new book, Devil's Bargain, is a very thinly veiled vanity biography, probably paid for by Bannon himself. Uh, and every other page is about Steve Bannon's career in Wall Street, his career in Hollywood, and his career as a uh, as a, a computer game designer. I thought this book was about Donald Trump's ascent to the presidency. If you want to read the truth about how Donald Trump got elected, you can go to the Infowars.com store and get your copy of The Making of the President 2016, How Donald Trump orchestrated a revolution by none other than Roger Stone. You'll find no self-aggrandizement in this book. This is about how Donald Trump did it. And believe me, folks, I was there from the beginning. Donald Trump is his own strategist. He's his own speechwriter. He is his own pollster. He is his own strategist. Uh, and it is to him that the credit belongs. Uh, let's go to uh, Richard in New York. Richard, you have a question. Hey, Roger. How are you? Roger, I loved you back in when you were on, um, when you were on CNN, CNN years ago. And also, when uh, this is a side note, when Mark Levin called you a thug, I said, thank God we have a thug on our side. So um, thanks. I'm really great to be on the line today with you. The question I have for you is, if... The leftist Marxists in the elite media and in Washington do try to take the president down, and they succeed in taking him down. Do you think the American people will march on Washington? Yes, I, I actually do. You see, the difference is that in 1974, the last time we had a coup in this country, there was one, only one monolithic mainstream media. There was no way to get information out to the patriots, to those who had an alternative view of what was happening. Richard Nixon was removed from office because he was a peacemaker, because he ended the war in Vietnam on a faster timetable than the Pentagon wanted, because he opened the door to China, because he reached a strategic arms limitation agreement with the Soviets. My God, the man was for peace. He had to go. Therefore, they took advantage of clumsy uh, uh, theatrics uh, and a ham-handed effort to bug the Watergate by underlings in the president's re-election campaign. The CIA learned about this, infiltrated the operation, botched it purposely so that they were arrested, and it was used to take the president down. The reason that citizens who opposed this did not march is because they didn't know the backstory. They only knew the version that was being told to them by the mainstream media. Thanks to the existence of Infowars and Breitbart and Daily Caller and Town Hall and Conservative Tribune and so many others, Americans will know the real story and we will march and there will be a spasm in this country if they try to undo what was done at the ballot box last November. Richard, thank you very much for your call. 
Um, let us now uh, go. Uh, lastly, we'll take one more call if we can. How about Tommy in Tennessee? Tommy, what's on your mind? Doing. Roger, how you doing? Excellent. Good. Uh, I just got a question for you. Nobody ever brings this up. I just want your opinion on something. Um, we know since March 9th, 1933, we've been under military government. That's why FDR was the last president sworn in on March 4th. And it don't have to do with the 20th Amendment. Um, we're under military government. I have been ever since. You think Trump knows this? Well, I, I think pre President Trump is not a career politician. Um, but I think he understands the dynamics of who's running the government. Um, I hope he's aware of the fact that there is an effort to isolate him by the generals. I've written about this extensively. Um, I put my faith in Donald Trump and the Trump doctrine. Uh, I believe in the end that he, when he has all of the information, he invariably makes the right decision. So this is really a question of not allowing him to be isolated in the Oval Office, cut off from his friends, cut off from his advisors, cut off from his key supporters. That is, I believe, what General Kelly and the military cabal around the president are seeking to do today. But having known Donald Trump for over 40 years, I can tell you, the first time he learns something that he wasn't told but should have been, something that he learns, or the first time he learns something that he was um, purposely uh, left in the dark on, there will be hell to pay. Uh, I'm Roger Stone, in for Alex Jones. Delighted to take your calls today. It's a momentous day in American politics. It's an extraordinary day for the Trump administration. Take heart. Our president is on the job. We've had a million new jobs since he was elected, a rock record stock market. And America is on its way to being great again under Donald Trump. We appreciate your support here at InfoWars. We ask you to go to the InfoWars.com store to allow us to continue to be the tip of the spear in the fight for freedom. God bless you. Victory or death. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. The hypocrisy of the left is stunning. On the one hand, they attack President Trump for his failure on their view to uh, denounce violence m most harshly, or I should say harshly enough. At the same time, they're in the streets advocating violence. If you see Alex Jones today on video, you can see these punks on the streets of Seattle uh, talking about the need for violence, advocating violence. The violence of the left is just as vile and wrong as the, as the violence on the extreme right. We have uh, one more call. I don't want to leave you hanging. So Stevie from Massachusetts. Steve, what's on your mind? Oh, thanks, Roger. Um, I'm actually a girl. Uh -huh. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I, I read your column on the Daily Caller. Uh, it made me feel a bit better about Bannon's removal. It seems like kind of a justified, you know, you had real, some really good points there, but it still feels like a loss to have him, uh, you know, kind of ousted or resigned, whatever. Who would be on that list to kind of fill his shoes that um, you mentioned before? You know, there there are others, but, uh, you know, it, who, would, who would that be? I mean, Stephen Miller's in there. Um, you know, who would come in? Sure. Well, first of all, Stephen Miller's a very good man, but uh, Scotty Nell Hughes, a woman, could certainly do this job. Uh, Ed Martin, uh, who we saw earlier on the program, uh, a key player uh, in Donald Trump's election, could do that job. David Urban, who ran the president's uh, historic campaign in Pennsylvania, could do that job. No one is indispensable in the Trump revolution other than Donald Trump himself. Uh, and perhaps that is the exact problem. This isn't about uh, the aggrandizement or ego of Steve Bannon, but he seemed more interested in his White House title and his office and his desk and his place in the entourage. 
yet he was absent in so many of the key struggles within this administration. So I'm still optimistic that the Trump revolution will move forward, that we will talk about economic prosperity and growth while they talk about race and race baiting, and that that is, in my opinion, uh, the formula for not only victory in the 2018 elections, but the re-election of Trump and Pence in 2020. Uh, bringing that matter up, now would be a superb time to go to the Infowars.com store to get your Trump-Pence 2020 t-shirt. Now, this t-shirt shows that you have your faith in Donald Trump has not been shaken by the phony narrative of the left over Charlottesville. Uh, this is a First Amendment opportunity to go to the store and show your support for the president. The other thing it does is allows you to meet like-minded patriots when you're out sporting your T-shirt. So, folks, we are under siege here. The Amazon, uh, Google, Twitter, Facebook monolith, the tech left is seeking to cut us off. We need your support. Go to the store now, buy one of these t-shirts, buy a hat, get in the revolution, uh, and help us fight for freedom, free press, and uh, the First Amendment. God bless you. Thank you for coming to Infowars.com. It's my high privilege to sit in for Alex Jones today. We will win if we stay in the fight. God bless you, and as I said earlier, victory or death. So I'm now joined by Lee Stranahan, who is, he's really been at the root of the Clinton-Ukrainian connection that has been ignored for the most part by the mainstream media. Last week, Lee, they gave you a little credit. They started to cover it. But let's start out by talking about Bannon. Uh, you know Bannon. You've been in talks with Bannon. Uh, what, are you, what is your reaction right now to the ousting of Steve Bannon? Well, you know, they say, be careful what you wish for because you just might get it. The globalists who pushed Steve Bannon and out have just unleashed the beast, Owen. This is the worst nightmare for them. Uh, Steve, now first off again, Steve, Andrew Breitbart and I co-narrated a film Steve Bannon directed called Occupy Unmask. Anybody who's not seen that, I would suggest re-watching it in the light of what we've seen with the re-up of the race war. That film is very prescient, and Bannon hired me over at, at Breitbart. Couple things. First off, when Bannon took the job with Trump, this is a guy who likes the microphone. Steve is not shy about his opinions, but he immediately subjugated his own ego to the Trump campaign, and you've only heard from him really a couple of times since then. And that's too bad because Steve is one of the most articulate believers and supporters in populism out there. So two things. Number one, uh, for the people who are inside the White House and outside the liberals, you, again, you just unleashed the beast. But the other problem was after Bannon left Breitbart, they lost it. There's a New York Times article right now, 5,000 word piece on Breitbart. I've been saying this for months, but they say it themselves in this big puff piece in the New York Times about Breitbart. Breitbart wants to be liked, okay? And Andrew Breitbart talked about the danger of that. Uh, he used to talk about, he said when he learned to, hey, look, if, if Alex wanted to suddenly be liked by the establishment, what would that do to InfoWars, right? It would demolish it. You cannot, they'll never like you. First off, they'll never like you. The only way they'll like you if you're a complete traitor. They'll never like you. And furthermore, you, you diminish your position. So take Charlottesville, They're just a simple example. We have the moral high ground. The leftists in the media don't have the moral high ground. Our position is very straightforward. Owen, let me, I'll ask you, just answer without equivocation. Do you oppose political violence? Absolutely. Right, that was easy for you to say, right? It's easy for me to say. They can't say it, the leftists can't say it. This and is true. Even the, and even the Republicans can't say it. So we have the moral high ground. We're the people who oppose all political violence. When I see someone who's a white nationalist run a car into people, I'm opposed to identity politics. When I see an Islamist do it, I'm opposed to identity politics. There's not two sides, there's one side. 
And that's what the Ukrainian story, by the way, really shows. We'll talk about that in a second. But so many Republicans and, and a lot of libertarians are wimpy. They don't want to take the moral high ground. We have nothing to apologize for. We're against racism. We're against violence, right? That's our side. And we should be proclaim, pro, proclaiming that on pre-caffeine, oh, and forgive me. No, don't I, worry. I, I got my caffeine, too. And, and it's an interesting point that I you made that about Bannon. Special you got. It's, a, it's an amazing point you made about Bannon. I completely agree with you. And it's also complete veritas, everything you broke down. Great points from Lee Stranahan. I'm now joined in studio by Roger Stone. Let's get your quick take real quick. What happened to Bannon? Well, I think he died of his own hand. I mean, uh, I wrote for the Daily Caller yesterday uh, a piece more in sadness than anger that on the key issues that matter to conservatives, but more importantly to Trump supporters, he just has not stood tall. When Joe Arpaio can't get his calls returned when he calls the White House to tell them how he's being abused by the Trump Justice Department, something wrong with the system. When Steve Bannon is uh, championing the appointment of Rex Tillerson, whose chief patron is Condoleezza Rice, uh, and we now have a Trump State Department completely peopled with Bush Romney retreads, there's something fundamentally wrong. I, I like Steve. Um, he, I think my worldview is probably closer to his. But on the key issues, on the key fights, he just hasn't weighed in. Uh, he's been a bit of a disappointment. Lee, your take? Well, first off, hey, Roger, great to see you. Great to be here. Um, my, my, my view is that when you go up against the establishment, it's very difficult. And I think Bannon was trying to, you got to remember, Bannon's got a military background, right? He's used to chain of command. And I think the, the big danger here, and I tweeted this at the president today, he doesn't know who his real enemies are. Look, there's three things about Trump that you don't need to be a psychologist to figure out. He likes being flattered. If you punch at him, he punches back twice as hard, and he loves his family. I believe Donald Trump genuinely loves his family. So they figured out how to get to him, and they got to him through his liberal daughter. Ivanka Trump is a New York liberal, the end. Her friends are Chelsea Clinton and Huma Abedin, uh, someone Roger and I have written about extensively before. When your friends Huma Abedin, there's a real problem. And they got to Ivanka at a party that was thrown at Wendy Murdoch's house right in January, where they had Mika Brzezinski and all these other people who hate Donald Trump. And I think Donald Trump has been suckered in. How do you get, I, I've learned this, Roger, you've worked on many political campaigns, more than I have. But one of the things that I've learned for, from my work in politics is no matter how smart you are as an outside consultant, at the end of the day, that candidate answers to their wife, their family, and the guy they went to college with. And it's so frustrating, and I'm sure you've seen this, Roger, where you give good advice to a candidate, and they ignore it because their wife or their daughter or their friend who they grew up with is like, hey, I don't know if you really want to take that position. Um, and so I think Bannon suffered from that. I got to say, I liked everything Steve said in that interview that came out in the American Spectator. I liked everything he said. I don't I don't disagree with that. And I wouldn't expect him to have a, a perfect batting record. The problem is that many, many times he just never went to bat. So uh, his supporters out today saying, well, <clears throat> now the White House is completely populated with New York Democrats. True. That's because Steve wouldn't help anybody else who was for Donald Trump get hired in the in the Trump administration. Now to suddenly complain that you're alone is like throwing murdering your parents and then throwing yourself on the mercy of the court because you're an orphan. Uh, well, in, in this case, he, he he did not help any allies, not in the departments, not in the cabinet jobs, not in the White House. There aren't many Trump supporters in the Trump administration. Fine men like uh, David Urban or Ed Martin couldn't get a hand up to, to try to get into the administration to help. These are experienced people. These aren't lightweights. These are political heavyweights, people who played a key role in the election of Donald Trump. Couldn't get the time of day from Steve Bannon. Yeah, no, I look, I've said that I, I have not personally heard from Steve since June 27th. When I had a medical issue, I reached out to Steve, told him about it, and he... He sent back a note on that. Uh, 
I know other people who've said that, well, I, you, you may know some of them too, Roger, that Steve wants to avoid this Russia issue. And I work for Sputnik. I host a radio show on Sputnik because they let me say what I want. They don't restrict me in any way. And it's a great platform. Uh, uh, but I know for a fact, I'm sure it's worrisome. It's worrisome to some people on the right. There are other people on the right, not just Steve, who are like, oh, well, I don't want to talk to Lee because I don't want to get caught up in this Russia thing. And as I pointed out, this whole Russia story is a lie. You and I were talking about it a year ago before I ever had an inkling I'd work for Sputnik. Well, My if, story Andy, if, if you're going to limit yourself to talking uh, only, to, uh, if you can't talk to people who are under investigation in the Russia matter, then you can't talk to the President of the United States. The investigation's yeah. a fraud. It's been a fraud from the beginning. That's the right. Russian collusion delusion. One of the main reasons why I wanted to get you on today is because there was collusion with a foreign country. There was interference in our elections. There was a presidential candidate working with a foreign power to affect the outcome of the election. Unfortunately for the left, it's not Russia, it's Ukraine. Uh, and um, uh, the whole Manafort drama, which we need to get into today, backs into this and you told me some amazing things the other day that i think our our listeners need to learn about the level intensity of the ukrainian effort to subvert our election it's amazing lee stranahan breaks the news of the ukrainian democrat collusion and then all of a sudden the russia narrative just disappears from the mainstream news every day interesting we'll be right back with roger stone and lee stranahan owen schroyer roger stone lee stranahan jedi council here we're going to get into the real collusion between the Democrats and Hillary Clinton. Lee Stranahan has been reporting on that. Roger wants to get into some of those details. I pitch it now to Roger Stone. Uh, Lee, uh, when Paul Manafort joined the Trump campaign, um, uh, really at the end of a string of primaries, uh, as we were moving towards the convention, it became very clear that the Republican establishment both could and would try to steal the nomination from the presumptive nominee. Because That's the right. Republican National Committee uh, convention is governed by not federal law or state law, by its own rules, we have a historical precedent. 1952, the nomination was stolen from Robert Taft and awarded to General Dwight D. Eisenhower. So the hire of Manafort um, struck fear in the hearts, not only of the establishment Republicans, but more so Hillary and her friends went into overdrive looking for dirt and I think when they couldn't find any, they sought to manufacture some because Manafort's reputation as a political gunfighter was very solid. This is a guy who knows how to run a national campaign. And to his credit, I think he was a seminal in Trump's nomination and preparation for the general election in terms of building a structure that could function during a general election campaign. Uh, at the time that the news broke regarding supposedly illicit payments to Manafort from the uh, a democratically elected or democratically recognized political party in Ukraine, I immediately smelled a rat. Uh, and this became a concerted effort to drive Manafort out of the Trump campaign, um, really at the behest of the Clinton Democrats who feared his leadership and his assistance to Trump. You have now done yeoman research on the backstory of the entire Ukrainian effort to affect the American elections, and that's what I wanted to talk about today. What happened well, here, Lee? Well, it's real significant, and, you, and a, a couple things. I was at the press conference where Ted Cruz in Texas basically announced that he was going to fight this. He realized, remember, there was a point in the election where he realized he couldn't win on the popular vote, so he started pursuing a delegate strategy, right? And that's the point they brought Manafort in, and he was a great hire. Now, as you mentioned, in mid-August, stories started to come out in the New York Times, Washington Post, Reuters, every major news outlet. They found a secret ledger in Ukraine, and a prosecutor says Paul Manafort was receiving cash payments in this secret ledger, also called a black ledger, in the Ukraine, okay? Now, let's cut, let's cut to June 27th of this year, after the election. The same prosecutor who announced that secret ledger comes out and says, lo and behold, oops, no, Manafort's name is not in that. There were no cash payments. That's what he said. 
Now, how many media outlets do you think reported that? The Times, the Post, nobody, nobody. Bloomberg is the only people I found who reported it. CNN mentioned it literally at the bottom paragraph, the last paragraph of the story attacking Manafort, okay? Now, anybody who looks into this, now, by the way, the other thing you would assume from this Trump-Russia narrative is that Paul Manafort, he's Russia-connected, he's Russia-connected. It's very clear Manafort was actually giving Yanukovych, the president of the Ukraine, advice to move away from Russia, to move towards the EU. It's exactly the opposite of what the media is portraying, right? So the fact that they reported the secret ledger, but they didn't report the retraction by the same person was significant. Then, because I've been reporting on this, I was contacted by a source as close to this as you can possibly get in the Ukraine. And they sent me information about a investigation that had been opened in the Ukraine. I reported this two weeks ago. It's very important. I reported this two weeks ago and I showed the material to other people because I wanted to put a flag in the ground that I did it. I didn't want to burn the source. Now, just a couple of days ago, it's confirmed what I said. You'll notice these stories uh, indicate that the investigation was opened on August 1st, okay? This, the story came out in Politico a couple of days ago, this story here, and the caller one, they say that a parliament member's demanding more information. If you dig down into the story, you'll see the investigation was actually started on August 1st. So that takes us to that. This is election interference. It was a false story. They've now retracted it. And the rest of the story involves how the DNC was directly involved, I think illegally, in doing this. So the Clintons get to collude with Ukraine. The Clintons get to try to impact elections all around the world. The Clintons get to have all of this hush money and all of these foundations. But it's Trump. Trump's not allowed to say anything. Trump's not allowed to do anything. Trump is the one colluding with Russia, even though there's no evidence. So the Clintons literally get to get away with everything, colluding with Russia, colluding with Ukraine. Uh, Hillary Clinton gets to say uh, black people are predators and need to be brought to heel. Clintons just get away with everything. And then they use their attack dogs in the mainstream media to go after Trump. Now, Lee Stranahan, we've got seven minutes left with you. Let's get a boil down of everything we were just getting into with Roger Stone. Well, yeah, sure. The, the big thing here to look at, there was a political article back in January that started to outline this. And that political article points out that there's a, a DNC operative named Alexandra Chalupa. She worked in the Clinton White House. She was a DNC operative from 2004 to uh, 2016. And she's the one who met with the Ukrainians. Not only that, she also met with a, a, a group of journalists, Ukrainian journalists, at something called the uh, Open World Leadership Center. This is significant because this is not legal. The Open World Leadership Center is a branch. It's part of the Library of Congress. It's supposed to, by statute, be nonpartisan. She was using it for partisan purposes. Now, the other thing that I want to point out, and this is a story that was also reported that relates. After the election, so Donald Trump's elected in November. Alexandra Chalupa works with a guy named Brett Kimberlin. Brett Kimberlin's a convicted bomber. He bombed, a uh, lit off five or six bombs, I forget the exact number, in Indiana, Indiana uh, in the late 70s, early 80s, to cover up an investigation into a murder he was being investigated for. So he, gets, he goes into prison, he gets out of prison, and he becomes a Democrat activist. He becomes a liberal activist. He starts a group called Justice Through Music Project. He starts a group called uh, uh, Velvet Revolution, okay? And he does a lot of work in Ukraine when he gets out of business. He eventually marries someone who's Ukrainian, who he met when, he was four, when she was 14, by the way. I should point that out as well. Why do I mention this guy? Because Alexander Chalupa, the DNC operative, used Brett Kimberlin as the bag man to pay a foreign national to fly to this country and to meet with Democrat leaders where they discussed how to keep Trump from taking office. 
Now, this was reported later, ironically enough, by BuzzFeed. They didn't mention Chalupa's name, but they did mention uh, all the events. And then the Daily Caller uh, followed up and said it was Alexandra Chalupa. I have subsequently interviewed witnesses who confirm every aspect of this story. The Democrats are, in my opinion, clearly money laundering here, and an investigation needs to be called. Now, by the way, the two guys to watch on this are Chuck Grassley and mm-hmm. Steve King, both from Iowa. Uh, Grassley Senate Judiciary point- Committee. Well, yeah, yeah. And, and Grassley's pointed out the Ukrainian connection, and so has King. This is a story, and I'll put it like this. You just showed, Politico said, the U- Ukrainian government is looking into DNC collusion. Try to Google that. Anybody, use yeah. Google, use DuckDuckGo. No, the New York Times, the Post, nothing, nothing at all. Now, you said, uh, Owen, correctly, that the de- Democrats can get away with this. Why can they get away with this? We have to realize that we're fighting an asymmetrical information war here, right? They control uh, the the mainstream media, the established media, including Fox, and they do this through repetition. If they talk about a story, every they smeared Roger. I know the details of that story. All they have to do is say, Roger Stone colluded with the Russians. People see the headline. They don't read that he dealt with somebody who's never been proven to be Russian. After a month and a half after the hack, they never point that out. So we need to fight the information war here asymmetrically and realize, look, the founding fathers beat the Redcoats. Does that make sense? And the, the way they did it was not trying to, to fight them one on one. And that's one of the reasons I'm actually glad Bannon's out of the White House, actually, because uh, I hope he speaks. Up. I hope he starts speaking up again. I think he he will. You know, Steve is a brawler. And uh, I agree with Roger. Steve has not demonstrated that since he's been in the White House. And I hope that comes out. But but again, God bless you, uh, you know, uh, Roger. God bless you, you here at InfoWars for fighting this information war in an asymmetrical way. That's the only way to do it. But all people have to do to get red pilled on this is look up what they tell you and what they don't tell you. They print the story. They don't print the retraction. It's stunning, actually. It's very stunning. Well, what's really significant here, I think, is that the Ukrainian connection and the Ukrainian collusion to assist Hillary has to be viewed uh, now in light of the information that the Ukrainians have supplied missile technology to the North Koreans to make their missiles more viable and more accurate. This puts the whole thing in an entirely new light. The other question I get constantly that I want to address is, about the raid at Manafort's home on the 26th of last month by the FBI, where they kicked in the door, the front door, then they kicked in the door of the bedroom where he was sleeping with his wife. Uh, the purpose of this raid was intimidation. They are trying to yes. squeeze Manafort. They want him to bear false witness against the president. The, Mueller wants him to testify that, yes, I colluded with the Russians, and yes, Trump knew everything. I know Paul Manafort 45 years. That wow. is never going to happen. Never. They want him to lie, and he won't lie. Uh, and, but that's what that was all about. This is the heavy, oppressive hand of Mr. Mueller uh, in the kind of tactic that you use on drug dealers, not political operatives. Let me go further. Here's another story that you probably know about, Roger. It's been completely not covered. Do you know about the blackmail claim? And do you know about the hacking of Manafort's daughter, Jess? Yes. Do you know about that? Yes. That's a major story. And by the way, who was attacking him? Ukrainians. The same guy who supplied that ledger, Leschenko, he's a Ukrainian politician. He's the one who Manafort had to, I think, file a suit against and file a police report against saying this person's trying to blackmail me. And Paul Manafort's daughter was hacked. You never hear that in the news, right? He was hacked. So it's not just government intimidation. It's it's black ops intimidation and literal hacking of, of his daughter. Now, the other thing that's interesting is they never print Manafort. Again, Manafort, I'll tell you the best article, as you as you well know, Paul Manafort's father was the mayor of New Britain, Connecticut. Uh, I was doing some research in Connecticut newspapers. 
Uh, it was either the Hartford Current or the New Britain paper, had the longest quote I've ever read in the media from Manafort. And he lays out now that, that the, he was urging Yanukovych to move towards the EU, not to move towards Russia. The recent Washington Post story shows that when people were trying to set up meetings between Trump and the Russians, if they were trying to do that, if they were suggesting it, who was coming out against it? Even the Washington Post admits that. Paul Manafort, right? This is a complete smear job. I don't know Manafort at all. I've never spoken to him at all. It's a, but just as a researcher, it's a complete smear. The other thing that's really significant is what I've been reporting this week about Charlottesville. Charlottesville, if you just look up uh, Ukraine torch march, you'll find exact mm -hmm. duplicates of what we saw in Charlottesville in Ukraine in 2013. And here's something else. Uh, I don't know if you know this, Roger. David Duke, the white supremacist who was at Charlottesville, he is a doctorate, right? He calls himself Dr. David Duke. Do you have any idea where David Duke, would you, if you had a guess, what, what country he might have gotten that from? The island of Island State University? No, no, it's Ukraine. But oh. guess. It's Ukraine. Look it up. Just look up David Duke, Ukraine. He's got extensive connections. What happened in the Ukrainian coup is the United States, Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, John McCain, the CIA, and the media, we overthrew, and all funded by George Soros, we overthrew the government of the Ukraine and put in literal neo-Nazis. Anyone can look up S-V-O-B as in boy, O-D-A, Svoboda. Svoboda, there you go, right there. That's from David Duke's own site, bragging about his Ukrainian connections. So when I started to notice this, and I started to notice, could you go back to the picture of the torch march for a second? Go back to the last picture if you can. There you go. See those flags there with the red and black on them? That's the flag of the Ukrainian insurgent army who killed, these are actual Nazi collaborators. In World War II, they killed 60,000 Jews and uh, Poles, okay? That flag is the blood and soil flag. The top red stripe is for blood, the bottom is for soil. In Charlottesville, the guy who crashed the car into people can be seen walking down the street chanting blood and soil. Yeah. So when I started to notice this, this is what they're trying to do. I'll give it to you real quickly. They want to gin up a race war. They want to gin it up from both sides. And then they want to use that for a literal coup. If they can't get the coup, they'll take impeachment. If they can't get the impeachment, they'll take just an electoral victory, destroying Trump electorally. But, but mark my words, this is their goal. And they're going to do it by getting these. Uh, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, anybody who knows my journalism. But if ever there is a false flag operation investigation required, it's you. It's this situation in Charlottesville that the media jumped on. And uh, the DOJ is apparently investigating more into this. You guys, thank you so much, Lee Stranahan, for breaking all this down. Check out his website, thepopulist.us, and the CJS doesn't stand for Conspiracy Journalism School, no. Citizen Journalism School. Thank you so That's much, right. Lee. Thank all you, right, Lee. so Thanks. not only... Roger, are they trying to smear Donald Trump with the fake news and ignore all the Ukrainian collusion? We know that. They're trying to also censor the internet, rig up all of these social media platforms so that the average individual can't get the full scope, can't get the full truth, just what the powers that be have decided you are allowed to see. And another great example of that is that Gab has been removed from the Android App Store. This is breaking news, just happened yesterday. Clearly an attempt to stop a new independent social media from forming. We're now joined by Andrew Torba, the creator of Gab. Andrew, were you expecting this? Did you see this coming? What happened here? Well, no, we didn't. We've actually been on Google's Play Store for a number of months now, and uh, we had no inclination that this was coming. Uh, we knew it was always a possibility, but it just came out of nowhere. They said, goodbye, you're off the App Store, have fun uh, mm. for hate speech. 
um, you know, it's very peculiar because you have to ask yourself, why was our app removed after being in the store for months without any issues, um, you know, just a week after we publicly endorsed James Damore's Google manifesto and offered him a job, and just a day after we raised a million dollars, 500,000 of which was raised within 24 hours, mind you. So you really have to ask yourself these questions. Well, Andrew, first of all, I really dig your pajamas. Um, I, hope, <laughs> I hope we didn't wake you up. <laughs> Just kidding. Not uh, at all. It's, you know, this right is right. this this comes uh, in the wake of the extraordinary news that Diamond and Silk um, were taken off of YouTube. One of the most popular, uh, outspoken supporters of Donald Trump. I love those women. I think they're very funny. I think they're very effective in getting their message across. Now they, now they're harassing Gab, where I'm a proud participant. Um, this is part and parcel of, a, of an effort um, that should be addressed by the Assistant Attorney General for Antitrust in the Trump administration, except for that job is vacant. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, Steve Bannon made no effort to fill that job. We don't even know when the job is filled that the person, uh, man or woman who fills it will be copacetic with this mission. But they should be because the rise of a vibrant, robust alternative media is what allows for the election of Donald Trump. I'm just curious, Andrew, did they give an example of hate speech? No, we got no examples. We got no, you know, screenshots or, you know, here, this user said this. Um, and actually, Roger, I completely agree. And we're in talks right now with uh, Ron Coleman, uh, who famously won the Slants Supreme Court case, uh, you know, landmark First Amendment, um, you know, win. And we're speaking with him, you know, about our options here, because you're absolutely correct. What we have here is a duopoly, right? You know, between Facebook or, or between, um, you know, Apple and Google, rather, you know, they own and control 95% of the market for app distribution. And, you know, not having an app on those stores for, in Apple's case, objectionable content, and in Google's case, hate speech, uh, is absolutely absurd when we have, you know, 12,000 plus death threats to the President yeah. of the United States on Twitter. It's insanity. Well, hold on a second. I'm so glad that you brought that up. One of the top trends on Twitter, I'm not sure if it was yesterday or the day before, was yesterday. assassinate President Trump. You have members of our government calling for the assassination of Donald Trump. How is that hate speech allowed on Twitter, on Facebook, but then Gab gets removed with zero examples? I think we know the answer. Oh, of course. No, of course we know the answer. It's a double standard, and it's uh, a quintessential example of the ideological echo chamber that exists in Silicon Valley. The reality is, is that we are a threat to the Silicon Valley robber barons. Uh, again, we raised a million dollars in about 38 days, 500,000 of which came in in about 24 to 48 hours. Uh, we've openly spoken out against their ideological echo chamber and their biases and double standards towards Trump supporters. Um, you know, I have friends inside of Facebook, inside of Google, inside of Twitter, who are messaging me and saying, like, I, I'm fearing for my job. I'm fearing for my livelihood. And it's terrible. It, my heart goes out to them for being in this position. to have Just to like what happened thing. at Google. Just like what happened yep. at Google. Exactly. They're, they're, they're afraid that they're next. But I have a feeling that James Damore will not be the last person, um, you know, to stand up and fight back against this. And I actually had the opportunity to speak with him last night. And, um, you know, we're building an alternative technology alliance here. Um, if we have to rebuild the entire Internet from the ground up, infrastructure, communication, uh, DDoS protection, as you, uh, you know, we will do it. Whatever it requires, we will do it and we will plow ahead and we will win. We have the people on our side, and we have truth and the freedom of expression and liberty on our side. Well, I don't know if you realize this, Andrew, but you're 100% accurate. Here's a story from The Guardian today. Women say they quit Google because of racial discrimination. I was invisible. As Google reels from the fallout over a controversial diversity memo, multiple women say they faced regular discrimination and ultimately left. There it is. Liberal Google, women leaving, uh, people just leaving because they don't get a fair shot. They don't get a fair say. This entire issue is why I've affiliated myself with a group called freeourinternet.org, where they are doing yeoman work, pointing out how Google, Facebook, Twitter, Amazon are uh, running as essentially a jihad to shut down free speech and free expression. See, I think the left understands that um, that the election of Trump would never have been possible mm -hmm. without uh, without the uh, free. Uh, and uh, mass-based internet. Now they're trying to get the toothpaste back in the tube. 
so mm -hmm. that only the only news you get will be mainstream media. No gab, no info wars, no daily caller, and they will fail. And or they just want to put the cap on the tube so that we can't continue to force this information out there. One more segment with Andrew Torba, and then Roger Stone takes over the fourth hour. This is the Alex Jones Show. They're trying to purge the internet, folks. They're trying to go for full control over the internet. They want to regulate it, and it's not to protect you. It's to protect themselves from the truth being put out there against their lies, against their false narratives. Uh, the, the crew's about to print me another story. Some other people are getting banned on YouTube. We, we see this going on. They've demonetized us. They demonetize Paul Joseph Watson. They censor us on Twitter. But now they're just going to try to erase us entirely. If you dare, how, you know what, Andrew Torba, how dare you? How dare Andrew Torba try to create a competitive app with Twitter? Don't you know that Twitter runs the world now? How dare you compete with Twitter? How dare you? Right. It's, it's, it's terrible. The free market is just such a terrible thing. The ability to have, uh, you know, the freedom of choice to choose an alternative platform aside from the three or four that own and control and operate and fund uh, every meaningful access point to the Internet, every meaningful access point to hardware in terms of technology. God forbid somebody stands up and says, let's build something new and start over. So I got this story here just came out from the National Review, a, uh, I don't know this guy's name, but uh, you've got other people getting banned from YouTube now. Apparently there's a, uh, a Muslim man, Ahmad Musa Jabru and Abu Halima, I'm sorry if I butchered your names, who have now been banned on YouTube because they're Muslims and they, they dare comment on radical Muslim terror. I mean, they dare comment on alt-Muslim terror. And I want to coin a phrase right now. I can't take credit for it. I have to give Daria credit. She actually coined this phrase. All these people protesting in the streets, all these people that hate Trump, all these people that we see on, on Twitter calling us racists, they're alt-Americans. You want to call us alt-right? You want to start throwing the alt around, alt this, alt that, everything's alt? You're alt-Americans. All of these people that hate Trump, all these congressmen, all these people in government that want to call for Trump's assassination, everybody in the media, you're all alt-Americans. I think Silicon Valley fits into that uh, narrative as well. You know, they love preaching about how net neutrality is so important, but I think it's pretty irrelevant uh, when you have a handful of companies that can just no platform and unperson complete groups and individuals off the Internet. Yeah, just erase right? you that entirely. Exactly. And as you pointed out, Twitter doesn't give you the rights over your content. You, there's been other people that point this out as well. If you're on Twitter and you've got all this stuff, all